I'm Rick Johansson, and this is Iron Echo Design. This Inkscape tutorial is by request. I definitely appreciate everyone that watches and for your comments and suggestions. This came up a couple times, people asking if we could do topographic map art. And if you've been following along on the channel, you know I love doing maps. I thought it's a perfect union of art and science. And so we'll do this one today. This is Sicily. We're not gonna actually draw the relief. I'll show you an open source free resource where we can get the relief data. But I will show you some tools and settings inside of Inkscape that you can use to make this for yourself. I do wanna say before we begin, there might be some better software options, 3D rendering software, Blender, even Photoshop that could tackle this. But I'm up for the challenge and I put this tutorial together step by step to showcase Inkscape's capabilities and maybe give you some tools to throw into your arsenal. So let's begin. If you wanna follow along on the welcome screen, I am on the template A4, 210 millimeters by 297 millimeters. We're not gonna use this space, but if you have it set to this, then your screen size and ratio will look the same if you're gonna play along. So let's go with the order. Well, first we'll make a project area. I'll show you where to get the map data for free. We'll extract a main shape using, of all things, the paint bucket tool. Then I'll show you some lighting and coloring options you can do built in. We'll do a granular overlay. And finally, a couple drop shadow options you can use. We'll throw it all together. Molte bene. <laughs> all right. So I want to start with the project area. This is something you can use for even if you're doing like a logo or some other type of graphic. Sometimes you just want a background to lay it on top of. There's a couple basic ways. You could have a flat color. You could do a linear gradient or even a radial gradient. But the next level up, which is super easy, is called a mesh gradient. The mesh gradient, I'll show you lets you have many stops in different directions and bend it. If you've never used any gradient before, this is how it works. I've got my object here, it's a yellow rectangle. I'm on fill, fill and stroke menu. If you don't have it, it's this paintbrush thing in the corner or go to object, fill and stroke. Over here is linear gradient, click on that. And if you click the pencil, you get this bar. You have a start color and an end color, or in this case, a starting opacity, full opacity down here. If I click on the circle, the opacity goes away. So there's full opacity, there's full transparency, but you can change the colors to anything your heart desires. Now you can move it in different directions, but you want to bend it, or at least intuitively you want to bend it. I can double click and make another stop, add a different color in there, but you can't bend it and you're limited to just a linear direction, hence the name linear gradient. Let's get out of there, go back to regular fill and choose any type of light gray. You can go with any background for your map if you wanna play along. I'll just go with this gray. And to make the mesh gradient over here, there's a tool, it's called create and edit meshes. Click on that. And if you left mouse click and just drag anywhere inside of your rectangle, you get these bars, an X axis, a Y axis, and a whole perimeter. Each diamond, if you look closely, lets you change the color. See that? Let's change this one. Something there just for the example. And you see these arrows? This lets you bend where your gradient goes. Molte bene. Thank you. Let's clean this up though. So let's get rid of the stroke. So on stroke, X out of that. And if you lose your bars, just click on it again, double click, and they'll come back up. I want to have white in the center. So I'll click the center diamond, choose white. I do want to make sure I'm on full opacity when I use white, because if I make white by going full transparency, It'll look fine now, but if I take this project outside of Inkscape, you'll have all sorts of problems. So let's go with full opacity, white in the center. I'll click on my perimeters. I'm gonna cheat and use the gray I did before. I have a diamond down here. I'll make that lighter. I'll go with this center diamond lighter. I'll pull the middle off center and see how that looks. I mean, it's subtle, but it does make a difference. We're gonna drop something on top of it, so let's move on. There's your backdrop. Now let's get the map. In doing my research for this video, there are some very nice sites out there that give you the topographic map data with the relief, 3D views, bird's eye views, but they weren't free, or at least it didn't say explicitly we could all use these for personal or commercial purposes. 
And that's part of the theme of this channel is I want to show you tools and things you can use in your own projects. I did find mapsforfree.com and they say specifically that this data can be used under the Creative Commons license and even for commercial purposes. It looks like they source their data from NASA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the Department of Defense, and the German and Italian space agencies. So we appreciate their work. Let's go to the site. Here we are at maps 4 freecom a beautiful picture of our Earth showing some nice relief. Up here, there's some choices. You can select a country. I'll do Italy. It doesn't zoom in that much. It'll center upon it. So there's Italy. We want Sicily. Here we go. And some more choices over here in the upper right-hand corner. The default, at least for me, it shows all the rivers. But I don't want those, so I will unclick water. You can play with it and click on streets to show you the different main roads if you're trying to isolate an exact area. I'll keep the streets off. I did notice down here, OpenStreetMap is probably providing that info, and thanks to them, they've helped us in previous videos. Now I've learned from some of these nice free sites, which we appreciate, sometimes there's a download option, which there is here, so click download. It'll give us a nice PNG. Save that in any place of your choice. We're going to pull that into Inkscape. However, for the space star chart maps we've done, sometimes the download function gets taken away. So if you can't do an automatic download, you can still do a screen capture. So open up your favorite screen capture software and take the portion of the map that you want. So this is the backup version if they ever take away that little download button. Either way, we're taking a PNG file that we're going to put into Inkscape and customize it. So let's do that. When you're back on your canvas, drag in your PNG file. You'll get a dialog box. You want to take the image DPI from file and image rendering mode. We'll do none. Okay, there's Sicily that we brought in. I think I'll scale it a little larger. If I hold shift and control, it'll keep the proportions together. You may have more room on your canvas. I can't full screen my Inkscape because of the screen recorder. All right, we've come to a very common application here. How do you clip out a background of a PNG image? Or for our purposes, how do we isolate the island of Sicily? Inkscape gives us a couple ways to do this, and I actually have a dedicated video, how to remove the background of an image on this channel, if you wanna check that out. That's using the method of taking the Bezier pen and drawing an outline around the whole shape and then using it to clip it out. So if you wanna learn how to do that, check that out. If it's a landlocked, town or country that you picked, you're going to have to use that method. But we're using an island. So we're going to go with the advanced easy is what I'm calling it way to remove a background. It's with the paint bucket, which in the past I've called it the tool of confusion, but it's kind of growing on me. So this is a great instance of where it will work very well. One of the areas of confusion when you start with paint bucket is it's going to adopt the fill and stroke of whatever you were doing last. So sometimes when you're building a project, you're not sure what you're on, you try a paint bucket, it does something else or it doesn't behave the way you want it and you don't really feel like you have control of the tool. So let's start by setting the fill and stroke. So I'll just grab a rectangle and see what we're using. I've got a green rectangle and I don't want a stroke on it. Paint bucket is gonna let us quickly select an area rather than go around and trace the whole item and it's gonna dump out this green, but we can't use the default settings. This is the defaults up here. The default is it's gonna fill in by visible colors, threshold 15, grow and shrink zero, close gaps, none. This is what we want to do. So we're gonna fill in all of the blue on our image. Threshold 15 is fine, but I wanna grow it or shrink it by one pixel because if I zoom in, this isn't the best quality PNG, but it is good for the artistic purposes we're using it for. Okay, you ready for some paint bucket magic? Gone are the days of tracing it manually with Bezier pen. Watch this. All I'm going to do is push it once. <laughs> no joke. I'm not kidding. It's a good tool. If you're interested in seeing a dedicated tutorial on it, I'm thinking about making it. Just let me know in the comments. I'll go back to selector tool. And this is what we made. The beauty of vector graphics. Vectors let us see the nodes. So if I just double click on it, there's all my nodes. I want this negative space, but it's blank, right? But because I'm working with the vector, all I have to do is delete out these outside nodes and what was once negative becomes my path. I'm gonna draw a bounding box around these nodes to select them and delete. <laughs> Do 
Do you see what just happened there? We took the selection that Paint Bucket gave us and then we just inversed it by deleting the outside nodes. And we're left with the shape that we need to stamp out that relief. Before I do that though, I'm gonna use this a couple more times. I'll do Control D to duplicate it. We'll put a couple of these aside. We'll use those in a minute or two. Let's get back to stamping out our relief. I've clicked on our paint bucket isolation there. I hold shift, I get the original PNG object clip set. Look at that. Time for some adjustments. I wanna alter this into a surreal color palette and we'll start with, I'll show you how to do the lighting and contrast. Click on the item. Up here you'll see filters, color, now there's been some confusion under extensions, there's also a color choice, but we wanna be under filter, color, and go down to lightness contrast. If I click live preview, it'll show you these settings that I used last, which looks like this, <laughs> not what we want, but a good habit I've gotten into rather than just start from this ugliness and try to make changes here, zero it out, just hit zero and zero. And that brings you to the original. And from here, it's a lot easier to see what the modifications do. So there's a plus four. Let's go plus two on contrast and make it a little bit darker, negative two. Anything that looks good for you, we're gonna drop a color filter on this next and I'm trying to get some good black values and some good darkness contrast in the mountains here. When you have it the way you like it, click apply. For the color overlay, I normally go to filters, color, and simple blend, but there is a pretty cool feature here. Right above simple blend, you see Quadratone Fantasy. Click that. Again, you get your slider bars here. I'm gonna zero these out by pulling them down to nothing. The choices we have, the top slider is for hue distribution. The next is for colors. The first blend option, you can do normal, multiply, or screen. Go to screen, and the second blend option, same thing. Let's keep it on screen. And if I click live preview, it's gonna do this. <laughs> it turns it into, looks like mold. We don't want that. So let's just play with it first. Take the hue distribution, and if it's not actively, there it went that time. If it doesn't actively change, unclick live preview, then re-click live preview. Sometimes the computing power isn't there to do it in real time. This is the Quadratone Fantasy Filter, and I can kind of see where it got its name. Definitely some interesting looks you can get here. When I was practicing with this earlier, I actually chose a zero for hue distribution. Instead, I did the color slider. That's a nice minty landscape. I think I did a hundred. That's it right there. I like this blue and brown. We're gonna change this to more yellow in a second. And for oversaturation, same thing. Just see what it looks like. This is a 0.29, maybe that's too vibrant. We'll go down to 0.20, leave it at that. Once you have it the way you like it, just push apply. I think I do wanna show you while we're here, the filter I use more often, which is filter, color, simple blend. This is a lot more intuitive. You can either do a normal filter, which turns the whole thing that color like that. This is the opacity slider. So if you're in a pinch and you want to just have a new whole backdrop one color, you can use the normal blend mode. Another one that I use quite a bit is just color. That's going to recolorize everything. I'll show you one more. Overlay is probably the most useful. Click on that. Now that's not a good overlay color, but if I want to have it maybe a slightly more orangish yellow. See, so that could be kind of cool. Actually, we could go with that if you want. Should we keep this? Are we gonna keep this? Yes, I'm gonna screenshot this for future. You never know what's gonna come up. That's why I like having a quick workflow because spontaneity happens. Should we keep this? Nah, back to the plan. I wanted to show you how to turn this part yellow without doing a full filter like that. Just grab the Bezier pen and draw a shape over the area that you wanna have a little bit of your own blend. That's the fill color we had before. Let's change that fill to an orangish yellow like that. Down here on my opacity slider, it already was at 57%. Maybe I'll keep it there. Blend mode, very similar to that filter that was called simple blend. You can also change how an object on top of another item affects the one below it. So watch this, we wanna go with overlay right like that. Now that's too harsh. If I move it around, you can see it just kind of burns it out. But if I go to blur, that's what I wanted. <laughs> I just thought that's like a nice feature I wanted to show you. 
The next enhancement we're going to do is a granular overlay. And I want to highlight this because it works well with the built-in setting that Inkscape gives us. Remember this, we kept one of the original shapes because we're going to use it as a direct overlay. Right now, as you see it, it's an ugly green. If you're on fill, let's first go to full opacity. Over here, this one right there, pattern. Click on that and you get some bars. You wanna scroll down to one of them is called sand. Click there. And this is way too grainy, but if you zoom out, you're able to change the scale of this dirt sand here. So I'm gonna zoom out. Had to zoom out way out actually. If you click edit paths by node, what I'm looking for is this X circle and square. Let's grab the X and bring it all the way back down to our item. I think what's happening here is Inkscape is saying, oh, you want to control the pattern? I'll give you the controls on your workspace, the original page. That's our A4 setting. But because I scrolled all the way down, it didn't match up. So if that ever happens to you, zoom way out, like as far as you can practically, and look for your handles. When you grab the X, it's going to move that pattern. And if you grab the square, you can change the scale. Okay, remember those blend options we just did? First, I'll cut the opacity, go down to 37, 36, something in there. And the blend mode, let's go back to overlay. All I'm trying to do is give it a little bit of grit, a little bit of granular texture on the flats here. I'll zoom in so you can see the difference. See how it's flat, just looks blank right here in this valley. If you just add a little bit of texture, I think it helps with the overall look. Now our shape that we made that overlay with works pretty well. Let's say it didn't. I can click on it and go to path, dynamic offset and I'll see a little diamond here. This is gonna shrink it down in perfect proportion. If I just use the regular handles and shrink it, it won't work uniformly and some of it will go into the bay here. I'll do shift and control and just come down a touch. Leave it at that. Let's group the whole thing together so we can do our finishing touches here. I'll click out in no man's land and come around everything. Control G will group it. Now let's add the drop shadow. Inkscape does have a basic drop shadow function. It's under filters, shadows and glows, drop shadow, but it looks a little cheesy for this purpose now. If I go to live preview, hey now, it just, it just looks like it's floating like a science project. So let's not use this one. We'll close out of that. Instead, I'll use the other pre-made thing we had here and we'll slice it so we only put the drop shadow where we want it, maybe just right here. Actually, we'll do it just right here and I'll show you a different way for down in this part. Let's make some space. Let's duplicate it one more time just in case we need it again. Change the opacity back to full and I'll clip just this part right here. Get my Bezier pen tool to build a clipping shape. Collect both of them. So I held shift to get both of them together. Path, intersection. This will go underneath the eastern seaboard part. We'll make a regular blur with that. This, I want to show something different though. When I was practicing, I thought it looked cool to have this part be darker than that. So let's clip everything except that half and we're going to darken this area with the blend. The top one selected, hold shift. The bottom one selected, path difference. There we go. Let's change this to a black and our blend mode will be overlay and then we'll blur it. <laughs> I could have been more precise with that, maybe had to come up here into the valley, but I wanted to have a little bit of differentiation between the blues over here and the blues down there. Plus, I'm going to drop a shadow here. So that's why this shadow blur will be okay. Now it's time for this one. Drop it to the bottom, add a blur. Drop the opacity down, maybe a touch. Not bad. There's one more thing I want to show. It's one more what I call advanced easy. The regular blur, you just hit the blur on the slider down here, but I want to blur it more with the horizontal and not as much vertical. So to do that, I can grab my Bezier pen. I'll draw the random shadow area that I want. Start with full opacity and go up to filters, blurs, blur. And you get this slider box, which lets you control how much of the blur is horizontal and how much of the blur is vertical. So let's start out by zeroing it out. Let's go with more horizontal blur. Yeah, that's what I want. I wanted those striations in there. Maybe go to 20 something and vertical, just a touch, maybe a three, maybe a two, two is fine. Apply, go to selector, go to hierarchy and drop it underneath. And we can play with our opacity here. Once you have it the way you like it, go to edit paths by node. And now you can move it where you think it'll look good.
Let's group this whole thing together. Control G. Drop it onto our the first thing we did. <laughs> I made this off camera. The label so you know where it is but there you have it there is a way you can take that relief data from mapsforfree.com drop some color filters on it put it on a background add some shadows and call it a day